Okay, our next presenter is Uwe Hogroff from Northeastern University. And his talk today is entitled, Navigate Effectively the Future of Work. Please welcome Uwe. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing, okay? So why are you here? Why didn't you go to the other presentations over there? Anybody? Nobody? Uh, <laughs> I'm 25, so no worries. What? what? Oh, good, 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 good. So, yeah, this is what I usually ask my students when they come. So, why are you here? What, what, what is it what you're trying to do? And what I'm trying to do with my students, hopefully with you today, in one or the other way, is uh, to tell them about what they are able to accomplish. So, what will you get out of this 35 minutes or so that I'm spending with you today? Uh, make it interesting for you. Maybe you will get younger by a couple of years after the 30 minutes. Who knows, right? Uh, that question that was asked earlier is something we focus on quite a bit. And that question is, um, uh, how do you communicate? How do you translate a message to your senior management? This is one of the major elements that we try to educate our students on. Right? And I do this in Boston. Uh, you hear my Boston accent, of course. So uh, in uh, Northeastern um, has, a, if you don't know the university, we have like, I don't know, 40,000 students or so. Uh, but our focus is on experiential learning and co-ops. So where we work very close together with employers. So in February, for example, we had an AI symposium. McKinsey was mentioned earlier, not in a very good way, I thought. But they, they, they did a qu quite good job coming to us and talking about the future of work in, uh, in digital transformation. We had Sweetgreen coming to us, uh, Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, Genpact, Biogen, Takeda, Boeing. So we are working very close together with employers in the, in the area. I myself, uh, I spent many, many years in J&J, &J, uh, and I, I worked with uh, Grace, uh, predecessors, right? Uh, uh, you joined in 2017, I was there until 2015 at EMD Serono, leading the global analytics uh, department there. And then I decided to go to academia because I taught all my career next to my work in pharmaceuticals. So why are we here? Why are we talking about that? I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the challenges, opportunities, and how we do that, or how it can be done when we talk about artificial intelligence and what to achieve with that. You saw a slide like that earlier today, right? So somebody said, please read the slide, and we are somewhere on the slide. Don't read the slide, you will not find yourself, or maybe you do. But that is the world that we are living in. Somebody thankfully put this together a couple of years ago in 2018 or so. And the question that I'm asking, of course, why the heck are we doing that? Why are we spending all that money and effort? Why are we educating students? We have thousands of students at Northeastern to be prepared to come to you. If you're in a vendor, uh, I like the questions about what do an elite vendor bring to be successful? I worked with GFK. Anybody knows GFK? Gesellschaft für Konsumforschung. Uh, Infratest uh, for many years, so I was on the vendor side myself. Very important elements that you need to bring communication to be one of them, interaction, the ability to translate what you're doing to your, to your uh, customer, if you like. This is what we try to educate our students on. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter really what kind of product you have. So I, I work with uh, uh, with companies like General Electric quite a bit in Northeastern. Uh, we have uh, communication interaction with pharmaceuticals in, at Northeastern. It doesn't really matter what product you're working on. At the end of the day, it's a question of what decision is the best decision to make for an organization. Pharmaceutical, airlines, uh, cars, self-driving cars. This is the central question. What decision are you making? And if the decision is how to get a patient quicker to the treatment, then that is a decision where artificial intelligence might be the right way to deploy it and to use it and to be successful. At the end of the day, 
that is fake, right? It's fake news. Artificial intelligence is not intelligence. It mimics intelligence, right? You are intelligent. I'm intelligent. You all are intelligent. You sometimes use your instinct. But you are intelligent. The machine is not intelligent. It mimics intelligence. It's the other day I don't like to die somewhere because the machine fails. I'd like to see the doctor next to me, like the keynote speaker today, very eloquently described. So it helps us, it augments us, it has to be there to be able to help us in companies and organizations to be more competitive. You'd like to be more competitive than the one down the street, right? More productive, right? At the end of the day, the question is, even if we get a patient quicker to treatment, can we do this better than the one next door? There was kind of a conversation taking place earlier about we are getting our data together, we are working together. Yes, that would be fantastic. Uh, I remember me doing that. I was head of uh, global analytics at Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceuticals uh, from the mid-90s to the mid of the 2000s, and I worked together with Eli Lilly, with Sanofi, uh, and others, exactly with that idea in mind. It didn't work out. We were not able to share this information. Maybe in this new world, we're able to do that and work together for the common good. Because there's potential there, incredible potential. Don't read all the details on the chart. I give you the, uh, the gist. Analytics, trillions of dollars that they're able to provide by applying analytics in the most appropriate way to the value of an organization. Artificial intelligence, approximately half. But it's not on the slide as healthcare and pharmaceuticals, uh, around 0.8 trillion. Uh, McKinsey has this in a different part of their presentation, uh, and AI, 0.5 trillion. This is what we're looking at, right? In a study that I recently reviewed from uh, Next Vantage Partners, Big Data and AI, what they are talking about is 92% of respondents say we are increasing our pace of investment in Big Data and AI, 92%. But if you look to the bottom line there, 72% say we don't have a data culture. Two thirds say oh, we don't have a data driven organization. So you see that investment, that push, we need to do this because Sanofi, AstraZeneca, J&J, EMD, whoever else does that, we have to do this as well. Wrong, wrong approach. It needs to come from inside, it needs to develop, it needs to evolve. And it starts with building an organization, a culture, where you can build on. And that starts with people. Analytics and artificial intelligence is nothing else but a people business. People make decisions, not machines. Machines can help us, but people make decisions. There are some companies that realize that. Uh, we call them the enthusiastic innovators. And again, I'm quoting McKinsey here. Great study. If you have a moment, read through it. Uh, it's really worthwhile to, to consider. They see an increase in revenue. Those that jump on that. No, it's not that AI is replacing us, like somebody said earlier. It's replies, AI is replacing something we did beforehand. We can do it now better. So companies that realize that, in this study that McKinsey brought forward, they come up with these numbers. They have an increase in employee numbers. AI will kill us, not necessarily, right? But AI can help us to develop, go to the next level, and potentially come up with better solutions uh, for our patients, for the caregivers, for the stakeholders, for the payers, you name it. And you also see in this survey that if you belong to the AI resistor, you may have a challenge moving forward. Coming back to the question of competitiveness and productivity. Of course, some companies have an advantage, right? Amazon has an advantage. They are a digital company from the beginning onwards. Merck, Grace, was founded in 1700 or 1600 something or so. Yeah, that's right. So 300, whatever, 50 years old. They need to develop into uh, a company that makes use all of that. Apple, digital company, right? The year 2007 is a turning point 
uh, one iPhone or one uh, phone turns in uh, 12 years into 4 billion. We have 4 billion of those smartphones around. So th these, are, these are differences between organizations, companies, environments that we are working in compared to pharmaceuticals, of course. And this chart kind of illustrates that. Again, don't spend too much time reading through that. But you see in this study uh, that uh, uh, is uh, from 2017, healthcare is here. When it comes to assets, usage, and labor uh, uh, that um, this uh, uh, organization uh, identified to be relatively low or high in terms of progress when it comes to digitization, when it comes to digital transformation. I don't need to go into that. You heard this today, you will hear this tomorrow, but this is in, in a nutshell what we're looking for, right? We talk, today we saw surgery. I believe the panel talked about the surgery. Uh, we heard about um, um, diagnosis. Will this replace the, uh, uh, the physician uh, if a machine is able to do that? It's an opportunity to work together with the physician to make it more clear, more better, more comprehensible. And in pharma, uh, we are talking about discovery, we are talking about the development, and we are talking about commercial, uh, commercialization. Somebody said today mm, it's um, uh, to identify patients for clinical trials. Right? So if the message is sent to a patient a year and a half after the death of the patient, that there's a space for a clinical trial available, it's too late. It's really too late, right? AI can help. Um, by the way, uh, on the fun side, um, if you think about my business, my profession, after 25 years or so in pharmaceuticals, in education, to identify students that fit to programs is not that much different to identify a patient that fits to a clinical trial, right? Guess what? We're using AI, right? We use AI to identify those students uh, that for them may be the best thing in the world to go into a certain program and study and learn. Artificial intelligence, analytics. I happen to oversee analytics, informatics, artificial intelligence, and geospatial services. So we can, we can funnel them in the right program if we identify the right criteria that a student has somewhere in Michigan or somewhere in Shanghai uh, to come to us to Northeastern and study with us. Mm. It will continue to evolve. You all know the name, right? Uh, and what I already shared with you in the one or the other way was that our skills, organizations, institutions are certainly lagging. Mm. And business as usual will not cut it anymore. We need to be prepared. And to be prepared, you need people that have the right skills. What do you think is, um, uh, if you think about cyberbullying, just think about cyberbullying for a minute. Now think about professions that you're aware of. What do you think is the best profession that, that has the attributes, the competencies and skills uh, to help identifying cyberbullying? If you guess it, it's a forklift driver. A forklift driver. So because a forklift driver needs to be vigilant about that what is happening around. Right? Not just focusing on the task at hand, looks around left and right. That is not my invention. That is one of my business partners that worked as a consultant for a company sharing this with me. These are the opportunities that are out there, talking about reskilling and upskilling, right? Um, so there are challenges. The challenges are exactly what I just said, the lack of necessary skills. What are the competencies that I need to possess to be able to be successful? What is it what my company requires to be successful? And do they match, right? Mm. The other questions are about what is my strategy? How do I define my strategy? Do I have one? Uh, what are use cases? The panel talked about use cases earlier. Not every case is an AI case. Surprise. So there, there are opportunities to distinguish between AI cases and non-AI cases, of course. And you need a workforce that is able to work with the one or the other. Um, and we are talking about funding of, of AI initiatives. 
the questions that were asked earlier. How do you convince your, your leadership to invest in AI? How do you do that? What kind of attributes do you use? Success cases, maybe the one from earlier when I talked about McKinsey and say, look, the revenue goes up. Yep, good investment, we do that. Uh, but this is a question of skills that you need to possess as a professional and they go beyond natural language processing. Even though the word language is in there, it's not necessarily communication, right? You have to be able to communicate, to interact, to speak, to convince. As a vendor, as much as you have to do this as a, an employer in a pharmaceutical company. Um, those skills are changing. So this is a view from McKinsey um, and, uh, from 2019. So they are talking about the time frame between 16 and 30. And they are changing, not surprisingly, right? They are changing from manual skills, cognitive skills to technological skills, of course. And then we are talking about social and emotional skills, and we talk about the higher cognitive skills. These are the requirements of, employee, uh, of employers uh, in the year 2030. Of those that are already on the bandwagon right now, these are the requirements. If you're on the vendor side, you better go in that direction because this will help you to convince your potential customer <coughs> of uh, buying into a, a program uh, proposal um, that you offer to uh, use in your organization. I, I call them anchor points. Um, therefore, uh, I think that uh, make a difference. And one is certainly leadership, right? Like I said earlier, it doesn't help if, if you say, oh, my competitor is doing. No, it needs to come from inside, right? You have to have leadership support. And I'm using um, a couple of uh, uh, attributes here or uh, descriptions like agility, audacity, humility, and uh, dexterity uh, to be able to do that. You try something by continuing your core business. If you're in pharma, your goal is not to become an, uh, an AI company, right? And if you're an AI company, it doesn't, it's not your goal to become a pharma company, right? You stay to your core business, but you try, this is ambidexterity, right? To try that and bring it in into your organization. Audacity, right? Try something new, right? But you, for that to be able to have to convince you, leadership or get a leadership sponsor to be able to do that. And here I'm not only talking about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. I, I worked with Novartis for, for several years. I worked with j and I worked on the vendor side. That is true for any other initiatives that you have. This is what we try to accomplish. This is how it will help us to change the bottom line. You need, uh, we need support to, uh, to accomplish our, our goals. Management, talent, and learning, of course, with my profession that I have right now, I'm talking about talent and learning. The president of uh, Northeastern uh, uh, um, wrote a, a, a if you, a, a, I will show you the title of the book in a little bit, an excellent book uh, that will help if you buy it, uh, Northeastern, him and all of us, but you should consider it, it's a great book. It talks about three different literacies three different literacies, and those literacies are data, technology, and the human literacy. Those need to come together uh, to, to make a difference. Usually when I, and I use the same one, what the heck, I use the same one that I use when I talk with my students, and I do the same with you. Uh, those of you that are married, I mean, if you like to show hands, that's fine. If you're not, that's fine as well. But um, if, you, if you are married, um, you, you had a wedding, and in the wedding, you had wedding tables, right? So imagine you have a wedding table with 10 different seats around the table. Uh, how, many, how many different ways do you have to seat somebody, somebody around this wedding table? Anybody? I asked the same question to my students. Recently, somebody said, oh, I know. 3.6 million ways. 10 factorial, 3.6 million ways to seat people and 10 shares around the wedding table, right? So I gave you the data, I gave you the formula, 10 factorial, right? I didn't tell you that when I got married, I knew that my father and my uncle didn't talk for 10 years. 
I will not sit them next to each other. I gave you the data, I gave you the technology, the formula, but I didn't give you, no, I did, the human literacy. Only you know that, right? And that combination will not make it 3.6 million. It may make it 10, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> but but this, is, this is exactly where I think as, uh, as uh, organizations on the vendor and the company side need to focus on, on that combination out of those kind of, of skills, what our president is talking about. And if you, if you look into that, you have um, data literacy like analytics system technology, Python, R, SQL, Spark. This is what comes from there, right? Uh, you have um, advanced analytics, you talk about machine learning, for example, when you talk about predictive analytics. But then you talk about a statistical mathematics. I always say it's here, right? Without that, none of that happens, what we do. Zero, zippo, nothing. Um, but then you have uh, four others, and that is project management. That is uh, agility. Back in Merck or in j and I always call it like sense of urgency is one of the elements, right? You don't wait until next week, now. Uh, creativity, critical thinking. The communication, the communication with data, right? And then you talk about leadership, data governance, ethics, and privacy. At least this is where we focus on when we teach analytics and artificial intelligence uh, at my organization. So how do you companies that you all know with these new challenges? How do they do that? So let me start with my, my fellow countrymen in, uh, in Germany, Daimler Benz. So, they aspire to have 60 to 300,000 employees be part of what they call swarm organizations. I will talk about this in a little bit, a little bit more. Driving innovation both for processes and products. Another great company, by the way, is Zara. Excellent. Uh, they're doing it in a beautiful way. Another, okay, happens another German company, forgive me, SAP. Uh, so they, they, what they try to do is they try to one third of their uh, workforce uh, try to reskill them in learning journeys for six to eight months going through the whole system with cycles of full learning uh, uh, followed by on-the-job practice. Their focus is what do we need? What is it what is required? We have the leadership in place. Now we have to develop the talent to get where we need to be, need to be successful. This is how they work internally. at and coming to this shores, uh, uh, half of workforce is the goal to retain or to redeploy. And they have partnerships with universities, other educators to create a range of online training options and so forth. You can read the rest yourself. So if you compare how we did it in the past in the more traditional way, hierarchical, siloed. We talked about silos earlier. Every time we talked about data, I heard the word silo somewhere. And we talk about static. Bring data together. Data mining is 80%, somebody said, of what we are doing. Uh, data clearing, pre preparing it in the way that we can use it. In the gig company, it's all about fluency. It's all about the swarm, right? You and I, tomorrow, work together with him on that project, right? And the day after tomorrow, you and him and her work on this project. How am I able to do that? How do I get those swarms going out and uh, uh, respond to the needs? Or even better, be proactive and know what needs will arise. I need to have an understanding about the skills and competencies of my employees. Right? I need to have an archived system that I can dig into and say, OK, this is the right one, this is the right one, this one, this one. And they are working for the next five years, two months, one week on that project. It's not so far-fetched, right, if you think about drug development, talking about five years, is it? But that is the idea. And all the attributes that I'm using here, like uh, the partner ecosystem to working with vendors, how do the vendor fit in that most appropriately in that what I'm doing, how I'm selecting that vendor, what is the contingent that I have internally, and then applying AI, uh, RPA, or business process management. And those, like Forrester says, they are burstable. This is what I try to explain, burstable, they're going out, right? And then they're coming back, retracting, and organizing themselves new. 
Um, at the end of the day, what we try to develop is, and why we are coming in as a university, is to drive individual resilience. To reculture, train individuals. Reculturing, retraining means you may get another degree. You may invite uh, people from university to come in your organization and train them. I recently went in a company for six, 12 weeks and trained them on analytics and AI. This is what we do. This is what company work together with us to get those kind of skills in place to be able to survive, strive and survive in the, in the, in the age of digital transformation. Social capital, you all know social capital, right? If somebody says to you, oh, yeah, so we don't need you anymore, uh, we have a different talent coming, you better have the social capital, the connections in place to be able to move on. This is what needs to be in place as well. And then, of course, we are, we, we are trying to accomplish competitive advantage and higher productivity. So I'm, I'm borrowing here uh, from Forrester a little bit, not exclusively, but a little bit to illustrate where uh, where, we are, where we are going uh, in, in my organization to prepare individuals that come to us and learn either those in organizations or students that come to us from across the world. Uh, in, my, in my programs, for example, in the master programs, 80% of my students are from other parts of the world than the United States. So they come to us to learn those kind of skills and competencies. And for an organization, the first question is, what is that what I need? Somebody earlier said today, what is my business question? It always, always starts with that. What is my business question? So what is our need? First question. Next question is, do we have the right skills, the repository in place to answer that business question? We either need to hire, we need to let go, we need to reskill or upskill. Clear logical steps in place. And then you bring the right uh, um, activities into place, and they should focus around one single element. It is the benefit, the benefit for the employer and the benefit for the employee. Like, remember what SAP is doing, training, and then on the job, continue to work? That only works if the employee is satisfied with that, what is taught, right? You cannot teach it against anybody's will. You have to focus on that as well. Genpak's uh, uh, CEO at one point in time said, uh, business owe it to their employees to make technology more accessible by instating dedicated reskilling initiatives that prepare their employees and future generations to work augmented, uh, to work alongside AI. Our president, this is a book that I was talking about, says the same thing, three literacies, data, technology, and humanics, as we call it, or human literacy. Forrester then translates that by saying those employees that we have to be able to accomplish those kind of calls need to be poised, enlightened, adaptable, and knowledge-taking. Peak. I like, there are other descriptions, there are other books, other publications. I kind of like that. It's very intuitive, clear, straightforward, what they come up with. But this brings it also to the point that I like to try, uh, explain to you. This is why, how we work, right? To educate people that are poised, enlightened, adaptable and knowledge seeking. They go beyond, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then we talk about something they, I mean, I, I, I bring the uh, Forrester uh, full um, um, perspective in here. They talk about the robot quotient uh, and to bring this all together, what we're talking about is the future fit, the employee experience, the robots uh, quotient, and that in their perspective makes the ideal organization. So the, the, way, the way we respond to that or the way we work is in different ways. So for example, we have industry guest speakers coming to Northeastern. So we have, we, we, I'll give you a couple of examples that talk about the use of AI and analytics in our organization. So CVS, for example, Takeda, Biogen, um, Credit Suisse, Genpak. These are companies that come to us and explain to our students how artificial intelligence or analytics is used in their organizations. The other way we deal with that challenge is to prepare students for you to be able to 
help you by having somebody that has a very well developed understanding about those kind of technologies, data, and the humanics, is to work with companies. So our students work on, on projects, on real life projects. So we had two years in a row, students out of my program won um, uh, awards with the United Nations uh, uh, by working on one of their sustainability goals. So to be in in a project, translate that into action and present it back. In this case, it was here across, a, uh, down there, uh, 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 at, at the United Nations headquarters. So we have this very close collaboration with our, with our business partners in the industry and beyond. I shared with you artificial intelligence symposium that we're doing. Um, and if you scout the literature or the publications from most recently, you would see that um, Northeastern recently launched uh, an institute for experiential artificial intelligence. We do this out of our College of Computer Science in collaboration with the college that I'm working in to really focus on those three elements, data, technology, and human literacy. This is all what I had to say today. I have two minutes and 36, five, four, three seconds left. If anybody has a question, please feel free to do so and ask me. First of all, thank you for your attention. I really appreciate this. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, sir. Of Northeastern, I hope. Oh, good. Hey, thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I didn't get the last part. What are your thoughts on design and user experience alongside artificial intelligence? Can you be more specific? In my experience, everyone here talks about technology skills, but the human element, the way that we interact with technology, has an important or more important aspect. Yes. So, I'm just curious your opinion on the state of design, if you're seeing it in any of the literature that you're reading. Um, recently, that, that, uh, good, good question. So recently I talked with a couple of business partners out of my network in pharmaceuticals, and um, um, what I heard was there is the perceived niche, and that is a big niche, of people that have exactly that combination. So how to translate, so how to translate the technology, how to translate the data into something that can lead, at the end of the day, to a decision-making point. And that is lacking, as it seems, uh, in, in a number of companies. So yes, we are doing AI. We're getting all wonderful, beautifully worked out in terms of machine learning or natural language processing, deep learning, whatever. But then we have this big data sets there, or maybe even some information, but we didn't create the insight that we need to make the right decision. And they called it like a niche, but kind of a big niche. And this is, I believe, something where programs like this one or similar programs can help to make a difference in organizations. Yeah, I would say, do you, do you ever run an AI project with a designer and, and with a subject matter expert or something? Everyone side by side. Yeah. It's a vastly different experience. Absolutely. Than yeah. So the way, if, if I may, um, if I may, so a good friend of mine is a statistician. He explains this to me at one point in time the following way. What we do in analytics and AI is like an act, different acts in an opera, right? The first act is just you, right? There's a curtain coming up. It's just you going uh, together with the colleague of yours, let's say in marketing or clinical research, into a room and you talk about the business question, first act. This is the two of you, nobody else, right? The second act, curtain closes, curtain opens again, second act, that is only just you. You're going back into your machine world, you're going back into your data world and your technology world, that's just you. Curtain closes, curtain goes up, threat act, you're going back to your business partner, to your stakeholder, whoever it might be, right? You're going back and say, you know, this is what I saw. This is what I saw, this is what I, understand is happening here. You interpret that what you, what you found, right? Do I need to go back to act number one? Do I need to go back to act number two? Or are we good? 
right? Curtain closes, curtain opens up, act number four, bring it to the point, not alone, together with your business partner, where a decision is made. You are not making the decision, you're making a proposal, a recommendation, that a decision can be made. And you made it with the professional depth and input that is required. All of that, with the exception of act number two, is in collaboration with your business partner. And does it answer the question about design? Okay, good. Anybody else? Thank you very much. A good night and a good rest of the day.